So Kathy, you could have realistically three, four, six biosimilars mm -hmm. to the same reference brand. And your desire is to have one, but your payer complexity might have you have two, three. Mm -hmm. what, how do you make the decision? Is it, it's hard to make that decision clinically because they're all kind of, they're all proved based on the same data. I mean, it's not a tremendous amount. It's a mm -hmm. one inferiority study for each of them. So um, throw the dice, flip the coin. What's the mechanism? Evaluate your patients that are currently on those drugs. Then take that number, see who their payers are. Then look at, you know, formulary design for that. Put all of that into a spreadsheet. And I would love to be able to pick one. That's not our reality. So then I have to look at what I'm required to carry and what pieces I can move around within that it, within my patient population to achieve, you know, some, some sort of, if, you know, good performance on one or two or maybe three contracts. All right. And let's just say you have an outlier. Let's say you have a national payer or a small regional payer. It's mm -hmm. got a 2% market penetration for your practice, mm -hmm. but they have the, a fourth. Do you have the stock it formula or you tell them, sorry? No, we'll stock it. I mean, we're going to, treat the patient, I can't take a loss on the product, but then you get into just a little bit of operations. You know, we set up pop-ups for the nurses and everyone who would even be close to touching that product because I can't give the wrong product to the wrong patient. All right, Karina, um, do you have to make all, if again, we we're dealing with six potential now, let's say biosimilars, the same reference brand, do you have to have all six available? I mean, can you approve one and not another? When, you know, medical, you know, the basis for most plans is medically necessary and not experimental. Can you make one not medically necessary, but the other five, or can you restrict in that way? Well, I'll have two answers for that. On the commercial side, um, yes, you can choose whichever one, you know, the net, net costs um, to the health plan is gonna be a factor. Uh, the other factor is, um, you know, any sort of abrasion to the patients, to the providers, we do take that into consideration and make the decisions based off of those um, inputs. On the Medicare side, you really can only do stop therapy. So if it's, if it's available, if it's on the market and FDA approved, um, you can require step therapy. But if for some reason they have a trial and failure or they have some sort of issue with the biosimilar, um, we would have to be able to pay for um, you know, whichever product uh, the physician feels is most necessary. Um, does that change how they access it? No, if it's not there, if, if the hospitals are not stocking it, if the outpatient facilities are not stocking it, then they're gonna have to use what's available. All right. For Michael and Vivesh, it's kind of related because you both represent um, um, entities which have considerable size and market influence. Do you, do you tell payers this is what we're this is what we're using uh, if they're a small payer and you know you know there's not an option or uh, again will you do what Kathy said you know we're going to try to limit it to the fewest number but we'll end up stocking all of them if, if, if there are enough payer if any payer comes along and says yes you've got to use this no I, I think similar to Kathy's approach um, you know we would actually kind of work with our payers local payers to see if we can negotiate a preference um, based on our preference. Um, and if not, then we may have to carry one or two uh, for formulary. But, you know, we've been pretty fortunate in the, ma in the ma market in Massachusetts where we're able to use 98% of the, the formularies that we have for biosimilars across various institutions. All right. So All right. in my practice, in an ideal world, you would like to try to have everybody agree um, on one uh, biosimilar option. It just makes things so much simpler and reduces uh, chances of errors in any shape or form. Now, uh, in the future, say if we have uh, 10 or 12 different options available and we've got uh, different payers saying that they're only going to provide one um, over the other option, it's not necessarily one that's our preferred. Um, obviously, we're going to try to do everything we can to encourage um, you know, uh, acceptance of our preferred medication. And then I think everything else uh, 
may have to be on a case by case basis. If it's something that is not economically viable and puts us underwater and they're not willing to budge, well then we might not be able to treat that patient. And it's just that simple. Um, if it's something that we could permit and it's not something that would put us, an alternative that would put us underwater, um, we might be willing to entertain it, but we haven't faced that reality yet just because there isn't that wide number of biosimilar options. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's gonna be a little bit of a wait and see as things evolve, but we're always gonna be pushing for um, you know, one uh, preferred biosimilar option.